So these technologies, there's three things that they came out with that they realized this is the core of everything that's important in all of plant biology and human biology. The essence of life, if you will. First one is silicon, particularly in a form called silicic acid. Anybody heard of that? Silicic? I'm sure. Or have you heard of salicylic? Salicylic is the aspirin derivative. That's where there's a lot of confusion. Silicic acid is a very unique compound. We'll get into a lot more detail in a minute, but it's, a, it's the only bioavailable form of silicon. It's the only way plants take it up. And the scientists realize that silicon, even though it's not considered an essential mineral, plants grown without silicon are much more susceptible to disease. They have much less nutrition. And I think in the next you know, five to 10 years, it will become known as an essential element, even though it's just considered beneficial right now. So silicic acid combined with um, uh, specific synergistic micro elements. That's the first technology we realize this is core to plant growth. Second thing is amino acids uh, combined with your minerals, particularly, particularly L amino acids. And uh, I'll get into more details about the L versus the aminos and why that, that's very important. They realize this is building blocks of all life. And if we don't have amino acids in the right structure, in the right form, the right amounts, then we're, we're going to suffer our points. Third technology was specific micro life combined with biostimulation. We want to really feed the soil, but also stimulate the plants. And we want to do it in a natural way. You know, because plant, just think about our bodies. You know, you can eat McDonald's every day of your life, right? And you're going to you know, go to sleep and wake up the next morning, possibly. Um, but you're going to feel pretty bad, you know? Technically, it is food, but in reality, it's not really food. And so we can feed plants artificial stuff, and they'll technically, they'll grow, and we'll still get a harvest. But it's not optimal, and it's not allowing plants to do the right thing. And every time we use synthetic, something artificial in a plant, it creates unnatural growth, and there's always a balance, there's always a trade-off, cause and effect, right? This is how nature works. It's always looking to you know, seeking that balance. And uh, the problem with these artificials is, for example, uh, familiar with Paclobutrazol, it's a PGR, plant growth regulator, that's in uh, products like Phospholo, Gravity, Bushmaster. Um, it's intended, you know, during the second week of flower, a lot of people use it to slow and stop the vertical growth. And it absolutely does that function. You know, you're getting a really leggy strain, and it's reaching to the lights, you Hit it with phospholone, bam, it stops right there. Hardens your fruit and everything. But the way it works is it stops amino acid synthesis. When you stop amino acid synthesis, it halts other things. So you stop producing weight, you stop producing uh, hormones that fight off other diseases, you stop a lot of other processes that, processes that are very, very important. So there's always this trade off. So we want to do things in the natural way, <coughs> stimulate the plant in a very natural way. So those are the three technologies. Um, I'll, I'll break down each one individually, go into a little bit more detail. So the first thing is silicic acid. <coughs> As I said, it's the only bioavailable form of silicon. So if you look at, you know, Protect over here, it's a potassium silicon. It's one of the most common, it's the most common agricultural input of uh, silicon. We put it on, but what a lot of people don't know is that you put it into your soil and it takes about four, five, six months or so for bacteria to convert that into a form called silicic acid before the plant can take it up. So if you're in a two or three month crop cycle and you're dumping that stuff on, you're virtually wasting your money. And uh, bioavailability is everything. I don't care what you throw on. It matters about can the plant actually absorb it and utilize it, right? There's a study that we did. A very large agriculture company. I'm not supposed to say the name, but you all would recognize it because they make American Grow and other types of products like that. Came to Actison Hall. They have a research facility about two miles from, excuse me, four kilometers from uh, uh, Aptus in Holland, where everything's manufactured. So they came to Aptus and said, hey, we heard about your silicic acid, and we don't believe you. We think our silicon inputs are superior to yours, so we're going to do a test. They had a university actually oversee this study to make sure that it was done legitimately and had all the right controls and everything in place. So this is a published research paper in Europe. They took four hectares of land. A hectare is about two and a half acres. And they had one of the hectares and they did a control. They planted grass. They said, we're going to grow up for six weeks. And all we're doing is changing what kind of silicate you put in us. So in one hectare, they set a control. We didn't add anything to it. Second hectare, they put 5,000 kilograms of potassium silicate, which is like Protec, on, on that hectare. 5,000 kilos. These numbers are very important. One hectare, they put 2,000 kilograms of calcium silicate, which is another common amendment. And over here on the fourth one, they took one and a half liters of silicic acid, which is in this bottle right here. One and a half liters, which is about one and a half kilos. And they sprayed it over the, the land. 
And this <coughs> agriculture company was like, oh, that's cute. You guys are really, really good over here. And, you know, we'll see how it works out. And yeah, their big tractors dumping it all. And it costs a lot of money just from a sustainability and cost factor. It's a lot, you know, 5,000 versus one and a half. Ran it for six weeks. And then they cut the grass. And all they wanted to test was how much silica got into plant tissue. It's the only thing. The, uh, the silicic acid field had about 30% greater content of silica in the plant tissue than all three of the others. What's more interesting is the other three, the control of the two inputs, virtually the same. Flatline, about one or two percent difference. What that tells us is that the microbes didn't have time in that six weeks to convert any of that silica into some sort of form that's available for the plant. So bioavailability matters more than anything else. And here's why silica matters. There's some very cool things. There's, there's three key things that silica does when it's in that form of silicic acid, when it can actually get into the plant. First thing is, most of you have probably heard about this, silica strengthens the cell walls of all your, the, the entire plant. It actually gets deposited in the outer level, the outer layer, kind of the epidermis, like our skin. Uh, it actually works in humans too. The research for the cylinder, uh, the silicic acid came out of human research uh, because it gets deposited in every cell wall. And you think of like a, like a balloon, uh, you know, if you have a, a rigid balloon, it's like a good cell structure. And it's coated with silicon. It's kind of, you touch it, it hardly bends, right? It's very little gift. You stack a bunch of those together, and it's going to be a really solid kind of structure. Let's say you have a drought, and, and the water, when the drought happens, the water starts to leave that cell, and the cell gets kind of soggy. It's kind of like deflating a balloon, and it loses that structure. And that's why when you, you know, when your plants get dry, they kind of wilt a little bit, right? If you need to get your water again, the plant, the cells work up a bit. So it adds that rigidity to the cells. We've done a lot of studies at universities. This is where most of the research came from, actually, uh, in the universities, was uh, this, the structure of these cells. They feed one plant with and without, and then we would put different predators in, like uh, a worm borer lava or some larva is one of the uh, animals we did. They have these little uh, mandibles, and they try to bite into a sugar cane that is treated with silicic acid, and when it's not, we literally can't bite in because it's like biting into a stone, and it literally breaks off or, or doles their mandibles, and so they can't eat anymore. Puncturing insects, like they, they, they try to bite in, it literally breaks off their appendages because it's so hard for them creates this, what we call a mechanical barrier against these, these other diseases and pathogens. Mold has to latch onto something. And if it's a strong cell wall, the mold can't take effect. So that's the first thing. It's very, very important. And also, in that deposit, you know, silica, once it's in there, it doesn't go anywhere. And what's cool about that is when you cut your plant and you dry it out, and you have your, your finished product, it can contribute up to 10 to 15% of that total dry weight, just silica. But again, if it's not going into the plant, it's not getting it. So when you talk about bigger yields and, and having a, a more you know, sturdy end product, it's a really good thing. Another study we did was really cool. We took strawberries and we wanted to study how, you know, strawberries don't last on the shelf for very long, like you know, four or five days and you leave it out. The reason why is when those berry pickers, when they pick the strawberry, they, they, they squeeze it just a little bit, even if they're gentle, they bruise those cells, they break the cell walls and that leaches out different chemicals and it starts the rotting process. And that's why you look at a strawberry after a few days and there's kind of these little indentations. We actually took MRIs of the strawberry, took slices of it, took MRI pictures to see the actual cellular structure. You can see the divots where the berry pickers, like the fingerprints, literally, where it had started to, to break those cell walls and rot. We did this over a week. And you look at strawberries that are fed silicic acid, and there's no change. It's perfectly, exactly the same every single day. You look at the ones that aren't, and you can see it rot, 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 and they're gone. So in Europe, where they're feeding this to a lot of different food crops, because they're increasing the shelf life of these food crops by 30, 40, 50, 100 percent, because this, just the simple structure of the plant is so much stronger. And then, of course, you get more yield as well, more weight. So it's a very big deal. That mechanical action of silicic acid is, is unparalleled. And in nature, this is what happens. This is, not a, a, this is not something we invented. This is a natural process. You go dig out in a rainforest and see, why are these plants so healthy? That's the mechanism that, that is causing that to happen. The second thing it does is it is a nutrition manager. And silicic acid is a very sticky molecule. Um, most silicates are, are alkaline, and they raise the pH, right? Some people use it as a pH Ours actually goes down because it is an acid. It's a very strong acid. It's a very simple molecule. It's a very lightweight molecule. And it actually uh, attracts other minerals to it. And it works like a train engine, if you think about it like that. And that's not a chelator, which I'll talk about chelates in a minute. But it, it literally grabs other minerals and brings them into the plant. So when you use silicic acid, you can use less overall nutrition because more is, becomes available. 
you have deficiencies in your plant, you can actually use silicic acid to help balance the uptake. You know, most deficiencies aren't caused by lack of nutrients. If you're feeding your plant, there's stuff in the soil, but the plant can't actually take it up. And silicic acid helps facilitate what we call it. It helps facilitate the uptake of Yeah? Go. So this doesn't have an organism in it. It's literally just sprays on the acid. This is, this is just a, yeah, there's no what biologicals or anything else. The amount of it affects yeah, this is not organic. Now, in, yeah, in nature, though, the bacteria have to convert a regular source of silica into this form before it does that. But there's no bacteria in this. Um, you can actually drink this. It's not, not this bottle. This has boron in it, which will make you very sick. Um, but uh, the, um, the developer actually works with the Kentucky racehorses. So they found that when racehorses really push themselves really hard, all the little capillaries in their lungs, they, they burst. And the horses cough up blood. And as you can imagine, they don't like that, so they stop pushing themselves so hard. So twice a year, he actually goes out to Kentucky and he injects racehorses with silicic acid, and it strengthens their lung tissue, and they can push themselves harder. It helps help people with asthma, get off their inhalers, because it strengthens their lung tissue. Uh, it, that's where a lot of that research originally came from over the last 20 or 30 years. The developer saw that, saw the research, and he said, it might work for plants as well.